Hey, oh, it's episode number 194 of the Audible Farm Podcast. And this episode's brought to you by Couchtown Coffee. Look, I don't just mention Couchtown at the beginning of every episode just to say it. I drink the coffee every single morning. I enjoy it. I like what they do. And I think you will too. So all you have to do is go to CouchtownCoffee.com, find a coffee you like, and make an order. When you do, you can let them know how you want it roasted. And then uh, all you got to do is give them an address and let them know Audible Farm sent you. And you'll be on your way. If you let them know Audible Farm sent you, they'll give you 20% off. Why? Because Couchtown Coffee is that awesome. So check it out, couchtowncoffee.com. Like I said, it's one of my favorite coffees. You can find uh, find any coffee you like, and then they'll roast it how you want. They'll ship it to your house, and you can save 20% by letting them know Audible Farm sent you. There it is. This week, I am sitting down with a guest that I have been waiting to have on the podcast for quite some time. Neil Anders finally stops by. We've mentioned him before on the podcast. We've had some of his past bandmates on the podcast. I mean, this guy is the real deal. He's the real deal. I uh, I found out about his solo album based on a recommendation. We kind of talk about that in the upcoming podcast. And uh, basically, like everything I knew about Neil was from word of mouth, third person kind of stuff. And I I had to sit down and confirm some of this stuff with him on the podcast. And sure enough, he's a great guy. He's a a music teacher. He he did all of his own recording. I mean, it is just absolutely wild to think about all this stuff. I, I almost wished I had another hour to sit down and just keep talking with him. But we kept it to an hour or at least close to it. So I hope you guys enjoy this one as much as I did. I had an absolute blast sitting down talking with Neil Anders. And you guys, uh, I think you'll like this one too. It's episode number 194 with Neil Anders. It's the Audible Farm Podcast. With your host, Peter Stockdale. Today I'm sitting down uh, with Neil Anders. Uh, we're on the Patreon over there, and everything's going good. Man, I tell you what, uh, you've been someone that's come up on the podcast a few different times, um, over literally over pretty much the entire course of this podcast. You know, that's, it seems like every now and then someone brings your name up, and we've tried to do podcasts before in the past, and it just hasn't quite worked out timing wise. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I appreciate you having me. It's I'm sorry, it's taken so long. No, it's good. It's good. <laughs> Yeah, uh, let me see here. Yeah, maybe pull that mic a little bit closer. But yeah, so uh, I mean, I've seen you play before. I think the first time I ever saw you play was with Jay Clyde. And sure. um, me and a buddy from Iowa Central were like, dude, Jay Clyde band's going to go play over in Lakeview. Let's go check it out. So Lakeview? Yeah. That's one with the lake, right? Lake, uh, lake, yeah. 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 Lake. Was it maybe th- they do the Stone Pier? Yeah, it was something you guys were something out on the like pier, that. maybe like Fourth of July ish, something. Oh, sure, something. sure. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I think they do have like their town celebration. I think is tucked back to like in, like near the campgrounds. So yes. that might have been where it was at. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and uh, I remember there were like fireworks going off for the event. They weren't necessarily for you, but as <laughs> as you were sitting there watching you, there's all this pyro going off in the back, and I was making the joke. It was like, DJ Clyde's got their own pyro man. Yes, now. it's this... like you couldn't have planned that better. Yeah, <laughs> like, I don't know how to feel about this. I was upset that it did not go in time with the music, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> absolute massive fail. No, man. I mean, seeing you guys live is uh, is tons of fun and. Each and every one of you guys has done something amazing since that band has broken up. And I just I want to talk first and foremost about your album in 2018. Um, it's called All In, is that correct? Yes. yes. That was That's the title track. That's the first song on there. Uh, yep. The first song... Uh, and I'm not just gonna I'm not gonna turn this into a review because you'll just sit here and be like, okay. But uh, the first song, I, one of the first things I remember hearing was like, oh, there's tremolo on some of these guitars. That's that seems like, and I'm not trying to pigeonhole anyone. That seems like a forgotten effect. It seems like something the old hats use, uh-huh. you know. Um, but what took me back by like when you start to take in the album, it's like I can feel like as Beatles to Tom Petty to you know everything in that genre. I mean, we're talking from like the '60s through the '80s. You you took all the good stuff out of there and mushed it into an album somehow. So well, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's like the it's kind of has that like surfer vibe or whatever. Like yeah. I've just always loved. Um, that's kind of what that first track was. Because if you listen to the rest of the album, it's not really 
the same as that first track, but like I just, you know, it was just a fun track to do. It's yeah. just fun, you know. I feel like as I listened through the album, uh, each song kind of, it was like, oh, the inspiration for this might be something along these lines, but mm-hmm. like vocally, it's not what you would ex- seem, you know, expect out of this. So it goes a different direction. Uh, I recall one song having some kind of like a Southern rock kind of a vibe, maybe like a drop D kind of guitar type deal that people, you know, oh, make, sure, sure. You know, make popular. But yeah, it was one of those things. I just, everything about this album, I really, really enjoyed. And uh, Jeremy Ober actually turned me on to this album, believe it or not. He was like, this uh when it came out he's like this is one of my favorite albums that came out this year and i'm like i was like what And he's like yeah just of all the albums that came out like this and i was like locally he's like no no i just listened to this one a lot and i was like okay i'll check it out but oh, that's awesome it, and it, you know jeremy's another guy that like i'd love to hang out with more but it's like i live like over an hour away so it's like it's just tough but it is kind of cool like for whatever reason you know like the last you know, decade, I've just been kind of like intertwined with like the Fort Dodge crew. So, mm-hmm. um, I just can't thank those guys enough for, you know, just folding me into the scene a little bit. And, you know, cause sometimes I feel like kind of an outsider, like coming to town, you know, so, <laughs> but no, they've, everyone's been really nice. So, um, but yeah, it's like, I wish I could just hang out more, you know, yeah. but it's like now that we're old, older and I have a little one and it's just like harder to, just hang, you know? Yeah. It's, I mean, that's the thing that I guess would be the double edged sword with like all of this experience and, and time and knowledge that we've gathered. Uh, you know, some of us are growing up, you know, with the whole like family and that sort of thing. So it, it just is what it is. It's a double edged sword, but, uh, you know, the other thing that's kind of funny that I was just like, just thinking about, uh, it was like earlier today or yesterday was like, you know, like I, I bought tickets to go see like a few shows later, um, later this year. And like, I've been going to see a lot of shows and I just love it. And I was like, man, I wish I could have like done this in college, you know, when I was like really, you know, where it could have had like a huge impact or, you know, all the inspiration and stuff. And it was like, Oh yeah. Like I was broke in college. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I didn't have any money to like, you know, take trips to like Minneapolis or like, you know, like go see like different bands and stuff like that. That's why it's like, it's so awesome, like the shows that like Fort Dodge is doing, and yeah, and uh, Manson, Crash My Crater, like stuff like that, where they get like real deal, like big names in to like you know, I can just imagine there's younger kids that are watching those shows that you know, it's just awesome that it's it's bringing it to the local level like that, you know. Yeah, I mean, let's look at it the other way though. If you went to all those concerts when you were younger, you might not have uh, played guitar and uh, became who you are. So like, that's true. Because the other end of that is. I didn't go to college, so I, I got a uh, you know like a regular whatever throwaway job, and worked at it for way too long, and uh, had all this disposable income. Sure. I, just, I went to tons of concerts, but like I never picked a guitar up like through the majority <laughs> of my twenties. Yeah, yeah. But I was still that guy that was just like, yeah, I can play power chords, and that guy's good at guitar, you know, like. Yeah, I suppose there's like you know I did a healthy amount of like brooding and by myself in like a room, so like that's probably <laughs> like that's probably a, a good like little precursor to like writing some decent music. <laughs> ah, I guess. songwriter check. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's hilarious. So how did you even uh, get started on the guitar? Let's go with somewhere in that route, because uh, where you're at now and where you started are probably two completely different things. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, you know, we always had tons of different music growing up. Uh, My parents had old vinyls and um, I got to shout out my brothers for like showing me a lot of awesome, cool music. And you got older brothers, older brothers. I'm I'm the youngest. That's cool. (laughs) But, uh, you know, when I, around, it was maybe around, like, uh, late middle school when I first, like, where I bought my first guitar, and uh, from me to my next brother is, like, four or five years, so, like, when I was really getting into it, I was kind of like an only child a little bit, you know, I was, like, just going on deep dives in my, in my room, you know, and I think I had, uh, it was like, Russ Never Sleeps. A Neil Young DVD. Okay. So I was like, I had a ton of like music DVDs because like mm. that was back in like we didn't even have internet at that time. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, I was like just rewinding, 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 trying to figure out what he was doing. Oh, cool. And so like a lot of my right hand technique like comes from Neil Young, oh, just neat. like especially like acoustic. And I I don't know. Still to this day, I'm probably. Uh, I have more of a feel for acoustic just cause I, I spent so many years playing that like in my formative years, but like, 
Um, so that's kind of how it all got started. And then, you know, uh, like I mentioned, the music DVDs, you know, like a lot of people, they had like the Eric Clapton, like Crossroads DVDs. Yep. Did you ever watch those? Yep. Uh, yeah. The, the Last Waltz. I mean, there's a handful you could probably just throw out there and be like, <laughs> yeah. eh, a lot of people have these. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the, like that was awesome. And then you go through like Led Zeppelin and all that stuff. But like um, Jimi Hendrix and, you know, all the classic guitar gods that everyone kind of like passes through, you know, but um I tell you that, like the music I was in is like this is still stuff I love listening to now is, you know, like the classic guys like John Prine, uh, Bob Dylan, Neil Young. But then I kind of liked like the indie side of things like Fruit Bats, The Shins, um, different bands like that that I, I still listen to today. So that's wild. To, like, uh, you know, you got quite a wide berth of things there. I almost want to like backtrack and talk about talk about music <laughs> DVDs again, man. That's a bygone era. That was like. A, I know, I know. A flash in the pan and gone, but having them around was so cool uh-huh. to go see, like, I mean, I was a big Iron Maiden fan, so I had all these Iron Maiden DVDs, and they'd have, you know, like a 40 camera production, so you'd see yeah, all this yeah. crazy stuff from all these angles. Oh, they were and, awesome, and it's like, in the Led Zeppelin one, they had, like, you know, they had, like, three or four songs from, like, different venues, so, oh, like, you gotta, you gotta see, like... You almost got to see the different venues, too, yeah, while they were yeah, in. Yeah, That's pretty, pretty nice. sweet. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think there's... That's not a thing anymore now that digital media... I know, I, mean, I know, like yeah. music videos, there's, like, might be some live video footage out there. It's usually one-camera still shots. It's like, I remember, like, in, you know, college getting all, like, juiced up. You'd, like, crank the stereo and get your music DVD on and, like, you know, party <laughs> to, like, music DVDs. Because, like, you know, YouTube was definitely coming up, but it, like, just wasn't the thing it is today. Yeah. You know, like, where you could just find everything you wanted to find you know so that's true i mean you could just curate your own that's what it is you can curate your own playlist on youtube and psh, you know no more yep. music dvds yeah unfortunate but hey that's the way that's the way she goes <laughs> so how did you uh how did you transition out of just being like a basement plunker to playing with other people um i think my first gig where i actually like got up and played and made a little scratch was like in carol so like i got my start with the addison brothers and it was like uh, Brian and Bruce and uh, Brad, of course. So like Brad, Big Daddy Eddie, he's kind of a Northwest Iowa character, but um, he does a lot of DJ stuff now. But anybody that knows him, he's like got a larger than life, you know, <laughs> personality. He's just like, uh, you know, he's just the guy in the room all the at all times. But you know, he was he grew up. His dad was a big country guy, okay. so he kind of had that like real solid country background. But then like. I, they played like a lot of eighties rock stuff too. So, um, you know, Brad was the one that showed me the, you know, my first few licks on guitar. And of course they were like country licks. Mm -hmm. So, which makes sense why I, you know, like when I fell into like the J Clyde band and stuff like that, it was kind of just natural a little bit to have some of those, uh, that twangy feel, but no, that's, I did my first shows with the Addison brothers and I, I still love playing with those guys. They don't really, play much very often but if brad ever calls up and he's like hey you want to sit in like hell yeah dude that's awesome that's so cool especially to have like a band that like you got your start with that's still (laughs) out there i'll I'll play some like ronnie Millsap with you yeah let's do it (laughs) (laughs) it is like his brother plays this uh i don't even know what it is this is crazy guitar but he has like tons of like chorus and he plays like minor seventh chords the whole night it's just like (laughs) there's just part like something part you know deep in my heart that's like I love this, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I don't want to call myself out, but if <laughs> if I abuse one effect too much, it's always been chorus. <laughs> I don't know why. I just see. I've... I never had chorus on my old board, but I put it on. I built a new board uh, with the help of one of my buddies, Jay Schneider, and um, I got chorus on it. And I'm like, re- you know, I'm like, oh, this is awesome. I like wish I would have had this. Yeah, I mean, grow growing up when I was like carving my own guitar tone, like. That was what, like, most of my lead tone was like, uh, just pile on a bunch of chorus. For some reason, I think I, I dig it, you know? If, especially if it's not too slow and deep. I mean, if if yeah, it's yeah, too yeah. slow and deep, it kind of sounds a little wonky, but, sure. you know? I mean, that's really cool. I mean, having, having a band that you started out with that you still occasionally gig with is actually pretty sweet. I don't, I don't know if I've had anyone else on that's had, like, a situation oh, quite like that. Oh, dude, it's been years, though, now. But, you know, and it's, it's usually, it's not like, you know, we're usually playing, like, uh, just kind of a backyard thing at a bar and it's just like 
perfect you know it's but it's so much fun like i love doing it those those gigs are secretly some of the best gigs i mean like (laughs) i understand you're not playing to hundreds and hundreds of people well and you kind of get like different people come up and it's just a fun night it's like you know you can play a set and then like go drink some beer for a while and then and then go back up and you know it's just like that's it's just a fun night for everybody yeah i mean you've de- you've probably played a lot of different types of venues you know i i think about having seen you with jay clyde a few times usually bigger shows you know not not always like humongous but like usually it's like if you play at a smaller venue it's packed you know <laughs> like it's one of those types of deals so you have a lot of street dances and things of that nature so uh you know i guess like what is the what is the biggest difference between the two that you've noticed as far as like playing a smaller show and a bigger show as far as just like the venue uh just anything in general is there anything that's just like glaringly like well the smaller shows are best because of this but the bigger shows i mean it's obvious like the bigger shows are probably better because the payout or whatever and more exposure and bigger atmosphere but like yeah i think you know the nice thing about doing so many uh small shows is like when you do get to do a big show, like everyone's still joking, everyone's still having fun, everyone's still. So it's like, I feel like that's maybe one thing I would mention about it is that, like, you know, having that, like, paying your dues it can sometimes, like, just put you at ease on those bigger stages because you're just like, we're just doing what we're doing, you yeah. know, what we've done, you know. Yeah, it worked out a hundred times before, it's, it's gonna work <laughs> out this time. Yep, yep, yep. That's so I. It's weird. It's like people are like, oh, you, are you, you get, are you nervous? And I was like, I don't really get nervous, you know, for those. But I, I grew up playing trumpet and like my senior recital at college, I was like shaking, you know what I mean? Oh, man. But like, that's just a whole different style of music. It's like, yeah, that's like an, indiv- like, that's like an individual sport kind of yeah, deal. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And it's just like the accuracy and the, uh, just everything you have to, you just have to nail it, you know? And it's like, but yeah, some of that stuff. I mean, they're grading you down to posture on some of that stuff. It's just like, well, everything everything sounded perfect, but you were pretty slumped over. It's like, yeah, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're 100% correct. Playing those small shows, it definitely helps out when you get to the big shows. And and I I would definitely agree with the fact that I, I don't would say I don't necessarily get nervous, but there's like that 15 minutes before showtime anxiety where it's just like, I'm, you got to hurry up and wait right now. You're just yeah, hurrying yeah, up yeah. and waiting. We've got to stand here. we got to be ready, but we're not going on yet. And you just have to be like, ugh, you know. Well, and I will say it's like usually playing those big shows, I'm usually just, you know, having fun playing guitar. It's like I'm not like <laughs> the one like singing and doing all, you know. That so. is true. Yeah. I mean, it, it could probably be a completely different animal depending on what you're playing. But, sure. But I mean, I'm sure everyone else is just as used to their instrument as we are to ours. Like, yeah, it's more exertion for a drummer to play drums, but they've been doing it, you know? And if you flip-flopped, it'd be like, yeah, I'd be tired playing drums, but the drummer's fingers would hurt if you played the guitar, you know, or whatever. Whatever. You sure, know? sure, sure, sure. Well, whatever. Yeah. My fingers hurt. Oh, well, now your back's going to hurt. <laughs> uh, did somebody pull that out on a recent podcast? They might have, but that sounds very, very familiar from my recent past. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, the small shows, tons of fun. <clears throat> but getting the opportunity to play those big shows, um, you know, with you and Jay Clyde, and it, I feel like that was one of those things where you guys, each and every one of you had established yourself. So when you went a separate direction, you guys kind of already were like established musicians where it's like, look, we, we did good over here. We're going to do good over here. So when you yeah. guys, each one of you transitioned perfectly, I feel like, out of that situation. Yeah, the Jay Clyde band, they were, it was such a fun group to play in. I like, I love those guys because like everybody was just so solid and like uh, yeah like when we were <laughs> yeah. when we were clicking it was like we were super tight it was super fun yeah yeah it's it's wild to think like you guys were definitely one of those bands where like I you know like I can be in bands and joke about being you know like oh I'm the least talented person here what you know like I could you could joke about that with some bands and you guys would probably have to like fight each other because it's like <laughs> you guys were all very talented individuals so I mean. Leading up to the solo album, though, let's kind of transition from that. So, like, you leave J. Clyde solo album. How much time is in between there, or or what Oof. were they kind of? Were you kind of writing them on the side, and they didn't quite fit the mold? So you decided to go solo album type stuff with well, it. Well, you know, I had always had these. So if I can like reverse a little bit, even more no. than that, like, no. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. Well, you know, like we grew up, um, I remember we had this album, it was called, uh, the intimate Ellington. And so like we grew I like, I love jazz and like my brothers love jazz. And we listened to this one record before we fell asleep every single night. 
because we like were all in the same room and uh it was just this like really cool like super lazy but like somehow like incredibly precise like like slower bluesy type like jazz songs and like i think that like melancholy feeling or that like introspective thing just like it just kind of always came became a part of me you know just i love jazz like ballads and stuff like that mm-hmm. like all the duke ellington ballads sentimental lady or uh yeah sentimental lady anyway so like i feel like my writing style was like you know being a part of like a high power like uh southern rock band i was like i don't i don't know if i could like r- write songs for, <laughs> for <laughs> this band you know like and like of course like Corey and i wrote wrote some songs too which like i love i loved writing with Corey, but like um you know, I don't know. I just felt like when I wrote the album, I just kind of always thought that it was just going to be mine, you know, yep. just because like I I kind of knew the sounds that I wanted and I, I didn't really want to force force it on any on anybody. Mm-hmm. And so I just I made that record and recorded it all myself. And it was just kind of like, that's wild. Yeah. All right. So while we're backtracking, you, you mentioned uh, trumpet recital. Uh, your senior year in college, and you also mentioned uh, listening to jazz growing up. So, let's talk about. Did you go to music school and or like school to be a major in music? Um, yeah, yeah. I I, f- I feel like I heard through the grapevine you may or may not be a music teacher. Yeah, yeah. I teach. I teach. I'm All a right. middle school band director. Yeah. So, how did you decide that was going to be the thing? Let me ask you that. Well, you know, I had like anybody who is in education, you know, they, they had a teacher that was like just money, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, we had Tom Plummer growing, he still teaches there in Lake city. And like we run, we, uh, won jazz state, like state jazz, like five years in a row. And I was a part of like four of those years. Oh, nice. And then they like won it like a bunch of, again like in a row like after i left so it was like this like this dynasty Mm -hmm. of like jazz like greatness but um so anyway that's that's kind of how that got started and then um my brother actually went into music education too so i kind of followed him through bv and stuff like that because i really liked the professor jerry bertrand who was up at bv and was i was just kind of pumped to study trumpet with him and um, and so that's kind of how I got, got into that. But, uh, no, I just, I, I love it cause I get to teach during the year. I teach uh, guitar up at BVU, um, cool. during the year that's and awesome. then, you know, summer, I get summers and weekends and nights off to, to do this too. So it's like, it's kind of a nice little gig. I, I like what I'm doing where I'm at. So that's really awesome. Uh, I mean, there's a couple, like most of my music teachers that I had, um, I guess, like, I don't want to say the good ones, but, like, uh, the best ones I had, which are, like, they're still around here. So, like, Kathy Yoakum, who's been on the podcast before, and she's in, like, Jive for Five. Oh, sure. So, um, and they're, you know, they play around here. But otherwise, like, Tim Miller, who's with uh, Lone Tree Revival, Mm -hmm. uh, he plays trumpet with them. So, yeah, like, I mean, like, the whole uh, music teacher kind of inspiring you thing, like, I totally get it. Like, both of them were... Uh, very, very good instructors, like for what I needed at the time, you know, and like Tim Miller was like pretty much better than all of us, you know, as middle schoolers at every instrument, <laughs> which leads me to ask you this. Do, do you, can you play every instrument pretty much? I mean, quote unquote, play every instrument. Yeah. I play with the kids. Yeah. Dang. It's just like, we, <laughs> that's wild, dude. Well, that's all on the record. I do all the horn parts. Too. I was going to yeah, ask. Yeah. I had heard a rumor. <laughs> I didn't want to believe it. Uh, that's also my, go pull up the first, uh, wait. Wait till we're done with this, but pull up the first song and listen to it. You're going to be like, he plays all this. <laughs> did you play the drums on that album too? I did uh, poorly, but I got it to work. Yeah. Sounds great. So you're, that's all you on that album. <laughs> yes. Wow. That's mind blowing. That is absolutely crazy. That's why I'm, I'm super pumped. Like not to segue if you want to keep talking about it, but like I'm super pumped about this new album because I got like other people that are bet like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, you know, Jake Merritt's a monster. And like, so I did like kind of a, kind of an actual, like 
uh, same type of like horn Latin feel Mm -hmm. um, on this new record. And like, he just kills it. And I'm like, I could have never even, you know what I mean? (laughs) So I'm just, I'm so pumped to have uh, people play on the the new album and I really kicked it up a notch. So I feel like having a good drummer is, uh, I mean, like having a good everything's understated, you know, a good bassist is understated, a good drummer is understated. Uh, I can play drums very poorly, but which like I played them just well enough to realize how actually difficult they very, you know, they are to play because you start listening to songs like, what is this, a shuffle? I'm out. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. can't do it. Sorry. Like, or you just like you hear the rim, the rhythm in your head and like where the kick is supposed to land and stuff. You're like, oh, okay. and you sit down and you're like, yeah. Like, oh, a fill? Little, What's a fill? A little I'm... harder than I thought. <laughs> it's not a not exactly an easy <laughs> task, but I'll tell you what: you set the bar high for being a solo, like all you Trent Reznor style like album. No, it's not. Uh, that's a Nine Inch Nails reference for all you out there. But yeah, so like I can't believe that either. I mean, I I can see people like maybe making a solo album that's all them, but that's like I said, like I when I first heard it, I. I instantly was just like oh this is almost like beatles-esque with like how big it is so how many tracks like individual line track lines are some of these songs like how layered are they uh not you know not terribly to Mm -hmm. be honest because like you hear like stories of like some of those i don't know this just some of the newer albums that that you hear of that they have like yeah we dubbed you know beyonce's voice like 90 times and we that was the background and then we you know it's like Mm -hmm. none of that going on it was pretty pretty simplistic um but you know that record i kind of was experimenting with like multiple mics Mm -hmm. you know so like the acoustic might be like two or three mics you know and then i would take like the best you know say this mic the mids sound like awesome on it and then i've got like the 81 Ooh. pointing at the fretboard and i really like how that sparkles so i kind of do a high pass on that fancy and, and then I, yeah and then i kind of blend them all together to make it sound like what a guitar should sound like or not necessarily like especially with acoustic guitar if it's a really thick track the acoustic guitar is probably not going to sound like an acoustic guitar it's going to be a little more clicky and you know just to cut through the mix a little bit so yeah i, I kind of have to serve the track you know whatever you're exactly whatever you're recording so which is something i i kind of noticed as i was listening through it i was like the acoustic on this one sounds a little bit different than it did on that one you know and it's sure. it's like oh it, but it fits the bill for what the song needs and you know when you're using that many mics and like you said you're kind of mixing it for the song itself it i'm sure it lends itself i i just seen in action like my first time of somebody doing what you're talking about where they take multiple mics and then just like i'm just using this one for like this frequencies of mids the other one i'm using for like the lows and you know we'll we'll fill in the holes with something you know uh, like on the digital end but this is all gonna be you know 95 percent analog coming off a pile of mics i see the instrument that like i do the most that with is bass because like you you need so like usually what i do with bass is i always have at least two tracks and I'll take one track and I'll compress the heck out of it. And that'll just be like my, like the low, you know, so that it's just always there. So if like the bass goes up to a different note, that like that low, it's always going to be compressed like right there, you know. And then the the other track I'll, you know, high pass and then put like some grit and some like sparkle on it so you can get the highs. And then when you put them together, it's like, ah. Oh, Yes. Like, it's just like the super consistent low end with like the all the dynamic yeah. range of the top. And it's like, which I feel like is like honestly the hardest part about mixing a bass live, which is like, yeah, I'm not the I can EQ a guitar amp till who laid the rail. But for some reason with a bass, it's just like, <laughs> eh, it's missing something here. You know, yeah. you've got all the punch, but it's too gritty or, you know, it's well, and depending on the bass that you're playing, lots of basses can be like super boomy and like some ranges and then like when you go up on the neck it's like the low is like completely gone and Uh, you know what i mean so it's kind of depends on the bass usually like the jazz um the jazz basses those fender jazz bass are pretty consistent so that's i mean speaking to their long chat i mean they're you can't it's been pretty much the bass yeah exactly that and the p bass have been the bass you know for 
50, 60, 70 years now. They're just consistent. You know, it that's, is, that's, man. Yeah, that's part of bass. That's super wild. So this new album we've been kind of talking about a little bit before and kind of teasing a little bit in here. New album coming out. And uh, I think we discussed before the podcast that you don't necessarily have a set, like actual, this is the hard date that this is coming out, but it's basically complete. It is. It's done. Um, I'm just waiting on the mastering. Uh, so like what happened was like, I had like sent it to him. He was, went on vacation and then he sent me back like just a few small revisions. And I was like, oh, cool. But I'm on vacation now. And so like I came back a week later and then like now we're like three weeks, you know, like mm-hmm. almost a month down the road. And it's like, man, this is supposed to be done like yeah six weeks ago. But that's just the way it goes. But uh, yeah, it's getting mastered now. Um, and as soon as I get it back, I'll set a release date because I don't want to like just the way this has been going like i know as soon as i set a release date then like something's gonna happen i'll be like oh. yeah <laughs> it's always the way it works though i mean i'm i've only this is only the second album i've ever been a part of like the one that three finger betty's coming out with but like i totally understand that's like it's not always your fault it's not always their fault mm-hmm. it's sometimes it's just you just the schedules and everything just need to line up well and you'd rather it be the way you want and come out you know it's like if you've put like two years or a year or even more than in my case, like more than that, um, into an album. You're like, you know, what's a few week, a few more weeks. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Have it come out and not be finished or wait a little bit and it'll be done the way you want it. You know? Are you, are you guys recording that album? Yeah, yeah we've got one recorded and it's, it's in the mixing stage. Oh, so cool, like cool. we're, we're essentially done. Did you but guys, where'd you guys do it at? Speed of sound down in Des Moines. It's, oh, uh, cool. it's run by, uh, Misha, I did a podcast with Misha not too long ago, but Speed of sound. yeah, where's uh, where's that at? Uh, Misha actually runs it out of, and I believe it's just like an apartment right now. Oh, but okay. it's like it's been moved around. Like our first album was recorded in a basement, like an unfinished basement, and it I, sounds amazing. So yeah, I recorded in a like ten by ten bedroom. So <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it works for everybody, especially like. I feel like during COVID, people found that out. It's like, oh, I can just sit in here and just have a microphone. As this works, okay. Oh, well, shoot. Should have been doing this from the get go, yeah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, I interned at, like, I think it was Skyline Studios, but I think they closed shop, like, relatively soon. You know, that's been years ago. So I've just kind of, like, I haven't, like, kept up to snuff on all the Des Moines studios. So. So how did you get cool. involved with, like, recording stuff? Is that Was that part of your school when you were. Going to school? Yeah, so I actually double majored in education and studio production because I was like, yeah, I was, yeah, I was really into studio production and obviously still am. So, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, I interned down in Des Moines, and that's actually where I met the um, uh, Douglas Acres band. Okay, so they're like a kind of a country rock band too, and so. Um, they were actually the band recording their EP at Skyline at the time. And so I ended up like playing with them. Oh, cool. They had an album release at, uh, the, um, what's the, what's the venue in Des Moines? Uh, gas ballroom. Land. Woolies. Ballroom. Valor ballroom. Valor ballroom. There you we, go. We did like a little CD release party at Valor ballroom and I got to be like backstage. And I was like, just a kid, you know, I was like, you got to see the 20, green room. 20 years old or something. Yeah, back in the green room and stuff like that. And okay. like playing okay. a show there, I was like, all right, I'm hooked. Like, I don't think I'll ever like not play shows. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, I've ended up back there a few times. Uh, fun, fun stories. Uh, different podcast. Okay. But yeah, I mean, like, I, I feel like that also like explains another reason why this is such a good album. You know, like, so did you record all the new album yourself? Uh yeah yep okay so you're you're doing a lot of this in house are you mixing and then just sending out for mastering yeah yeah I mean mastering if if it's mythical fairy dust but it's it's necessary and I don't know how to do it and it takes a special ear to do it <laughs> well I think like to us you know mastering to me is is like number one just getting a fresh ear on it you know ooh yeah, yeah. and just because you know after listening to it so many times it's like you might not hear glaring issues you know, that like, that they can. Um, but the second thing is they, I mean, they just get it balanced for commercial, you know, 
exactly. just something, you know, they have like, uh, so I go through focus mastering, um, shout out to Doug there. Um, but he does a great job, but like the first album I went and like listened with him and I was just like, you know, dude, I won't even, I'm not going to ask like a million questions or anything. I'm just going to be a fly on the wall. And I was just like sitting back there and I was just hearing the album. Like, you know, he would just slowly just start tweaking stuff. And it was just like, I could just hear it like morphing, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, it, I don't know. It's such an, like I would, it's a super important step. I would put money on <laughs> yeah i mean that's what we ended up doing like based on like somebody recommending was like if you go get if you're going to get this mastered send it somewhere else to get it mastered you know yeah. it's it, you, you could do it all in-house but it's like you said sometimes better to have somebody else listen different to room, it different room different ear yep like it's just gonna you know the more speakers the more like places that you can listen to your music that's that's why i, I, I like i don't know how these like mix masters like you know chris lord algae can like he'll get a mix in like I've just heard these stories from uh I was visiting my brother out in LA sorry big tangent but um Ooh, one of my LA. brother's friends <laughs> Ooh, <I'm> yeah <laughs> <laughs> one of my brother's friends though was like Chris Lord Algae's number two like he got all the mixes ready for Chris and like he would send like people would send in their mixes and Chris would like do it so fast and send it back to him that they were like did you really mix it but it's like so they they actually like started like holding on to the mixes and then oh like sending them, you know like the next day. But it's like to my point, it's like I feel like I have to like tussle and toil and like it's just trial and error to like bounce tunes, listen to them in my car everywhere else, and then it's like and then I have like a page of notes, you know, and it's like okay, go try it again, okay, and then go try it, and everything's so interconnected that it's like how do these guys just do it like in one? try you know it's but i suppose if you did it every day for 30 years you yeah know. you'd probably get used to what what kind of sounds good and what doesn't or like what what platforms necessitate certain things so like sure. our three finger betty album was like mastered with an emphasis on putting it on a vinyl mm-hmm. so like it ended up uh taking out a lot of the overly excessive like Low punchiness yeah. that would cause a needle to skip was like literally what was i'm assuming in the brain of the person who mastered yep. our stuff so it's like so weird to think that that's also a skip a step that you have to do because it's not just as easy as like i mean what we're doing is easy you know you plug in the microphone in the interface and you just talk into it how much you got to mix it none you know <laughs> compressor boom done like sure yeah it's a little bit different when you're like got to tune up the guitar and get all the right mics and then you got to have all the outboard equipment or all the digital stuff to process it and yeah blah, blah, blah. and to think that you like went out and did a whole album with like horns and backing vocals and stuff and it's <laughs> it's not just you and an acoustic you know which is pretty mind blowing and uh not to like just spin off on another tangent but you're, like you're playing harmonica on this album and like the harmonica is not just a background rhythm instrument it's actually like taking the front end of the harmony of like certain parts of things sure, or like yeah. even the melody itself which uh was pretty mind-blowing uh when i first heard it because i mean you can get a harmonica in the right key and then anyone can play it like during the whole song and it sounds sure. great but well that's my neil young upbringing right there to, <laughs> <laughs> to have the harmonica you know take the front yeah. I mean, you did a writer's round type deal at the Fort Dodge Opera House not terribly long ago. Well, it's been like a year or so, I guess, but... Uh, the, uh, yeah, the Country Music Association or whatever. Yeah. It was like a, one of the writer's rounds that they they did there. Might have been what it was. I, uh, was it, it was the Broken Strings one was what it was. Oh, okay. That's what it was. I, sure. I, know it's like, I was like, Scott Kirkhart was there. Oh, Broken Strings. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're, um, I'm thinking of uh, Eagles Ballroom. Yes. Yeah. 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 So yeah. you're at, this was the Opera House and I remember seeing you play there and I think it was the first time I ever saw you play solo and uh, like as I don't know if it sounds trivial to say this. It's not. It's cool. Like uh, the harmonica, your harmonica playing like blew me away because I mean, like I said, like <laughs> I, you can put on one of those uh, little well, the Neil Young necklace or whatever people call it, you know, the little harmonica holder. And like, as long as the harmonica is in the same key, like I said, it's, you just honk through it and it <laughs> sounds pretty decent, you know? <laughs> yeah, sure. But like, I don't know. So did, did you actually take time to sit down with the harmonica and like practice enough? To, I mean, you had to eventually like play it enough to get that good at it. Or was it something where you just kind of figured out the mechanics and then we're like, this is what I'm looking for, for these songs. And I don't, I don't know if it was like a trumpet thing. Like, you know, I'd be like, 
I figured it out right away. But like, it really did like come just pretty easy. I don't know why. Um, just, you know, to, like obviously everyone can, you know, blow air in and out. But um, uh, as far as like getting getting the uh, individual notes, you know, that took a little that- bit of work to like to like especially to be able to like do that, but then to slide between individual notes and stuff yep. like that. Um, but you know, like to bend is really easy. You just say we, we, oh, I never knew that. We. <laughs> just say we, uh, I got a harmonica. I'm going to bust it out afterwards. <laughs> yeah. gonna have to give me a lesson. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool though. Like, so how do you, I guess, I mean, it's just curiosity. I'm sure where you start to figure all this stuff out. We're like, how does somebody do this? Google, bam, this is somebody said this, you try it, it works. But it also makes me think, I'm assuming trumpet was like your quote unquote first instrument or like your, yeah, the one you like pl- fifth, yeah. Fifth grade pickup trumpet. Yeah. I took some piano lessons, but just did not practice. I kind of kicked myself a little bit cause I wish I had, you know, some more keyboard skills, but, um, yeah, trumpet was kind of the first thing I learned on, so... So that makes me think, when you were talking earlier, when you were just like, oh, I figured it out right away with the trumpet. I mean, it probably lends itself because you've spent so much time with it. Have you ever, like, sat down and been like, okay, like, you pick up a trumpet, honk it out, and you're like, it's these notes, and then you pick up the second instrument, and you're like, it's these notes. Like, have you ever, like, done it that way, where you're like, I can get it with this one real quick, but for some reason it would take me a while, but... Dude, I'm, I'm kind of a... Uh, for better or worse... Um like just pl- have played by ear like and have gotten by like and faked it <laughs> like for far too long you know what i mean like as as opposed to actually being like what i would consider like a a, a real musician who's who's kind of like knows what he's doing and why it works and like how to transition to the next thing and what's coming up and like what chords and things like works you know mm-hmm. and like i'm obviously getting there a little bit like the the, <laughs> the more i play but like uh yeah like i i did a lot of just listening by ear like and just playing what i thought sounded good and I guess I had just listened to enough music that I kind of knew what to do, if that makes sense. But mm-hmm. nothing, uh, nothing I could really take like a ton of credit for. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't be too modest about it. But like, I, I mean, you bring up a really good point though, too. Where, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we were talking about. Oh shoot! Now I'm now I sidetracked myself. Um, oh, this ain't good. Thing We've good. been on a ton of tangents, but yeah. I don't, it's it's all good. Um, uh, okay, yeah, I remember what we're going for. So playing by ear versus um, somebody that is like I would say just like mentally transcribing everything out with like you know flawless execution or whatever you know. Because <laughs> I do get it. I've taken music theory class. It was like uh, whatever Iowa Central's like first year of music theory, but it was offered at my high school. So whatever, I took it there. And I understand basic music theory, but like you also understand it's like there's rules that shouldn't be broken, but can be broken in certain situations. If like this, you know, like they kind of have their own little like things, but there's, it's also kind of like a lawless world, but you, you also brought up the point that it's, it's not though. Like there are rules (laughs) that kind of need to be followed. Everything kind of feels like it's supposed to go somewhere else. And I mean, jazz is like the music for musicians, so it's it's all about rule breaking and stretching everything yeah. to the max. But yeah, jazz is like the ult- like in my mind, like uh, like those guys know what they're doing. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> it's like the pinnacle because it's like not not only do you have to have like like an extreme mastery of your instrument, like to like an insane degree, but then you also have to like be applying it in real time like constantly and it's just like dude the 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 cats that can play jazz are like they're yeah (laughs) on like a whole different level yeah that's that's the music for musicians you know that's why i was because like most people are just like jazz is boring and it's like (laughs) like yeah i I mean it sounds like all wrong notes to you but to us it's like they're (laughs) stretching this out like i just i liken it to like imagine just like two wrestlers and one of them is like a veteran the other one's like having his first match and he's just folding them like a lawn chair that's what he that's what they do to the music it's insane to listen to some of that stuff that reminds you say like playing wrong notes and that reminds me is like i think someone like said that like charlie parker was like um you know when he first first started playing like bebop and like kind of blowing everyone's minds like well 
you're playing like so many notes and he's like well i can play a ton of wrong notes as long as i like land on the right one you know yeah that's kind of <laughs> like, true it's like it, it's like yep. a that's just a grace note it's just a grace note it sounds great you <laughs> yeah, know exactly oh my gosh that's hilarious of course he was being modest he's like insane Charlie, but. <laughs> i i remember seeing like uh so like obviously for anyone that understands basic music theory there's like scales or whatever and uh, everything kind of has to fit in the scales to an extent, but there are ways you can kind of hit accidentals and things like that and go outside the scales. But I remember seeing somebody online made a song where they like used every fret of the guitar in, in like a single <laughs> note fashion throughout the course of a song. And it was like, that's, that's pretty wild actually. And they did it, you know, they pulled it off pretty well. It wasn't just like, well, we'll just chromatic run through a few things. It wasn't just that. So it's wild to think that there's people out there, like you said, that can take that deep of knowledge and then apply it real time to an instrument that they can play that oh, well. Oh, sure, like, sure. Because, I mean, there's people that can think this stuff up but could never play it, and those people are just transcribing music for others to play. I mean, that, that makes sense, you know? I mean, that's your... I think about, like, so much music that we've probably played, like, growing up in, like, junior high, high school, and things like that. Those, those people could probably all play the music and stuff like that, but there's, you know, there's probably still a bunch of those that's like, well, some of these people are just probably composers as opposed to being like you know musicians themselves yeah yep but absolutely. i do also feel like i remember hearing stories about like I, you might have to correct me but it's like you know beethoven or whoever was like writing stuff that was like so difficult that people were like this is too tough to play and he was like well we got to find somebody that can play it then you know because i want this this is what i'm hearing and i want to be oh you know. i'm sure there was like kind of a back and forth you know where it was like let's see if they can play this you know oh my like, i never even thought of that but also too you, you got to think that like a lot of the guys that were you know like beethoven and whatever that the, they were writing were like they were prodigies themselves mm -hmm. so like they were writing to like you know to, like to reach their full potential of like what they could play you know just to mm -hmm. kind of show off and it's like here you can try to play it too. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that would be absolutely hilarious. <laughs> so it's like the uh, ultimate ego trip. But. It would be honestly. It's almost like a one-upsmanship between you and your buddies, <laughs> which which is kind of the benefit of like you said, having a music scene around you and just being like, oh, there's a music scene over here. I pal around with some of these guys and and this you know those guys over there are doing some good stuff. So we got to up our game. But nobody's ever like, I don't like you because yeah. there's never <laughs> any of that around here, which is kind of crazy honestly definitely some competitive nature can help drive you a little bit absolutely. oh yeah for sure for sure so this new album you were mentioning other people are on it so let's kind of run back through again who's going to be on this album with you so uh of course mentioned uh jake Merritt. yep um so he he played drums on quite a few of the songs um his brother greg played bass on a few songs and uh man having greg around was awesome because like I don't know if you've talked to him much, but like his like music knowledge is like crazy, like almost encyclopedic, you know oh, what I mean? Dang. Like just knowing like styles of music and like what fits, what shouldn't be in there. And like the hilarity of like when things are like mismatched or something like that. Um, so like, I really think he could be like <laughs> a producer of sorts, you know, like, it's like anytime I was like wanting any feedback, I'd be like, Greg, what do you think, man? You know, just cause so, um, super fortunate to have him in on the project. And then, um, also met through, I think I was playing a Brad Morgan gig and I met, uh, Jay Schneider, uh, out of Des Moines and he's like insanely talented, um, keys, uh, guitar. And he's actually playing with Tony Bonenkamp now, like, doing like the dueling pianos and stuff and he's like oh hold, cool he's like holding his own you know like it's like it's so awesome to see him like start to you know spread his wings so to say <laughs> but like he's a super insane cat so he he came and did um keys uh he brought his roads down which is like really awesome we took like an hour and we were like tuning it all up because you got to tune the fins and everything oh, to get whoa. like you know because like you that hammer hits and then like um the i'm gonna sound stupid trying to explain this but like t you have to get that fin like perfectly so you get the right attack and then like the right decay and like uh so it's not so you know because they're like pickups mm -hmm. so it's like if they're too close or whatever they can be boomy okay and it's like you know like a, you can think of them as a guitar pickup but like so like definitely got an education 
as far as well, far as that goes. But uh, you no, know, he came down and like within a day, he like had played every like everything on the album, and it was just like you know like chewing gum like while he was doing it you know so All nonchalant about <laughs> yeah. it so like um so he did uh keys on the track so um between those three guys they like you know definitely like brought the tunes to life a little more you know so that's awesome it's exciting for me it's like thank you guys so did you have anyone to bounce the first album off of like idea wise did you ever do any of that because you i mean you had you had people with this new album to do that with you know, not really. And that's um, in this new album, I kind of just wrote everything myself as well. So, like, that's I'm really looking forward to not doing that. Like, just like in my own head, like trying to get something out and all that. Because, um, you know, I'm like really looking forward to like collaborating and like maybe writing stuff that I've never written before. And so I think that's. You know, I I can't wait to get this album out and we'll give it its due, but um I'm like, dude, I'm already <laughs> looking forward to like not hearing it. Again yeah. For a yeah. While. Well, like, I guess if you're doing everything in-house, that's <laughs> makes a lot of sense though too. You listen to it 400 times. Yeah. And... No, I'm I'm ready to like do something different already, but uh but yeah, it'll be fun. So, can we expect this new album to sound uh somewhat similar to the last album or did you completely change your style and go No, it'll it'll be it'll be pretty similar. Um like I said, I'm kind of looking forward to doing something different now, but um yeah, true to that style, there'll be some you know, acoustic like kind of stripped down tunes, um some more like indie rock type stuff and then uh, I do have another um it's kind of crazy. I'm just thinking about this, but uh like the first song has horns on it. It'll it'll be actually very similar, but um, uh, better in a, <laughs> in a good way. So and there we go. I can't wait. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah, I mean, like that was super fun to listen to this album and like you know on a recommendation from another musician and be like, somebody made this music like right over there, like <laughs> like just right over there. Are you serious? You know, it, it, it's pretty mind blowing to think that. I mean. Like I said, I'm not just out here to jerk your chain for a whole hour, but man, it's uh, it's pretty wild to think that you can pull all this off. But you know, being a music teacher, I'm sure well, that's I mean that's your job. So all you hear all day long is just music in your head, you know. <laughs> oh, dude, I I really do appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think anybody who's a musician has this feeling. But uh, who was it? Um, I think it was Kevin Parker, you know, Tame Impala guy. Oh. Uh-huh. He's like kind of a, a Australian singer, like that does some like psychedelic like pop. Okay. But anyway, he said I was like listening to an interview with him, and he's like, you know, being an artist, like making music, you you're constantly caught between these two voices in your head of like uh, someone who's like genuinely believes in themselves, and it's like you're kind of an egomaniac about it or whatever, and then like there's this whole other side that's like you're super super fragile and like riddled with self-doubt and like (laughs) like like so like every single project that i've done it's like there's definitely been like a handful of times where i'm just like i just want to like delete the whole thing yeah just be like you know just kind of curl up in a ball or whatever but that's like you know you're just you're just constantly like juggling those two sides of yourself you know yeah, I uh, I feel the hurt because I mean there's a, I mean there's a few of them over here that are still just left over and they're almost, they're like almost like <laughs> gravestones of random projects that I yeah. I had started. And there's riffs in there that are neat, but uh, it just gets saved and it never. No, that's the end of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I feel that though too though. Like being a musician, you're like, dude, I can do this. And then there's like sometimes where somebody gives you literally the the nicest constructive criticism and you're just like, <laughs> what was wrong with it the way it was? You, know, you start to just feel attacked by it, bad or, about it. Or my problem is like, I, I'll just hear like so much other amazing work or just <sighs> yeah. people that are just flat out like naturally talented. Like I feel like I've had to work so hard like getting my voice up to like a passable level, you know, and like to hear people that can sing and just be like, mm, yeah, singing. Like, oh man, <laughs> always blows me away. <laughs> like it should be easy. We all talk every day. We should be able to <laughs> sing. It should be natural, but it's not. <laughs> 
Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, I'm totally looking forward to the new album. I do want to like change it just a little bit. Uh, you mentioned sure. that you were at the NAMM show uh, recently. So let's kind of talk a little bit about that. Like, what was it like? What was your thought process going out there? Were you out there studying stuff for like the upcoming album? Were you just kind of out there for fun? Or Well, I'm very fortunate that my school district like lets me go and they help me like they pay for my flight out there which is like a huge help like now nowadays um but um yeah so i go i go to some like education uh stuff out there definitely and then um but yeah it's just it's like i can't i mean you've seen like videos of the floor and stuff there it's like it's just mind blowing how much there is and like i think i the first time i went this is my third time the, f- the first time I went, I was just so like disoriented and like, <laughs> it's like so huge. And like, and every time I've gone there, I was like, I'm trying to recruit people to go with me, but they're pretty like stringent. Like you have to be an educator. You have to be like a actual like merchant or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, so every time I'm kind of alone, so it kind of stinks. I don't have anybody to like, yeah, it's like, no, it. be like yeah, oh, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I'm like, if anyone wants to go with me, um, but yeah, no, the, the sessions are really good. Um, I got to meet... Uh, I still need to throw pictures up. I I took a bunch of pictures. I haven't thrown them up on uh, the Facebook yet, so it's it's not official that I went and, unless, oh, yeah, unless I do that. But, it never um, actually happened. <laughs> but uh, I got to meet um, <clears throat> Warren Hewitt. I don't know if you know, like, watch his channel, like, Produce Like a Pro. I've watched, uh-huh. like, a ton of his stuff um, uh, where he just, like, goes through mixing stuff. He's got a good mixing channel. Um, and then, yeah, it's just like the biggest gear geek out like you could ever imagine. And then like, there's these like phenomenal bands playing constantly, like all around you. So (laughs) it's, it's, it's it's quite the, uh, quite the thing. Yeah. I think the aristocrats were started at a NAM, if I'm not mistaken, like, uh, you know, the aristocrats is a band, whatever. It's like, uh, Guthrie Govan and some other people okay. not to, not to <laughs> neglect the other people. <laughs> They're just as good as he is, but they were like, we're like a jam band at Nam for a while. Sure. And somebody like live recorded their set and was like, that was awesome. And so they went in the studio and like recreated it apparently like note for note almost. And really, and they were like, there, there's an album. It's an hour long. <laughs> and yep. so, I mean, there's crazy stuff going on there. Another thing that blew me away about Nam when I started looking into it was, you got your Gibsons and your Fenders and your PVs and your Marshalls or whatever. So like all the obvious stuff is sure. there. All the new stuff they got, their classics. Here's some fancy guitars. But there's a bunch of stuff there that's like, I never heard of any of this stuff. It's like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, this guitar maker is killer. I mean, it's like three grand for their cheapest guitar. But, I know. Yep. But check it out. And it's like, oh. And you can kind of like play them all and yeah. Yeah, it's pretty the, wild. I especially like the pedals. Like they'll have like a pedal booth like all these like little boutique companies that you can just like throw on earphones and like just hear them all and it's like (laughs) they sound so good and it's like i don't know if this is like the you know the 500 hundred dollar blue headphones that i'm listening (laughs) to like i don't know if it's because of those or um if this pedal is like that insanely like awesome but um yeah it's just like it's so much fun it's almost it's it's you can be overloaded like very quickly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One thing I don't know too much about Nam, uh, Nam, uh, went to Nam back in Nam, uh, the Nam show, Nam. Uh, but yeah, do they have? Th- I know they have like recording and and accessories to guitars and things like that. But do they have other like? I'm not trying to make it sound too weird. Like I don't know, but do they have like instrument like trumpets and like oh, sure, all that yeah. kind of like other stuff? Because I think it started out as a like a marketing and like kind of like a, just a get together and display of like all these music, music companies. Is that what like literally what the, yeah, there's like, um, the Anaheim convention center is like, it's huge. And then they have like multiple floors, you know? So, and then like multiple buildings, I think there's like ACC North and then like the main convention center. Um, but, um, yeah, they have, everything so it's like you can walk through and it's like oh this is like the dj and lighting like oh that'd be so huge cool. area it's you like know, guitar and- center but not sucky is what it sounds like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no offense guitar center i'm sorry you guys shot yourself in the foot yeah yeah <laughs> that sounds absolutely wild i would love to go to one of those one time but and then yeah brass section and then like you'll walk by like the drumming section there's like you know 800 
not that many, but you know, a super crazy amount of like drum sets and everybody's playing them. So it's just like, (laughs) 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 Oh, that makes me think as a music instructor for middle school, right? You said, uh, uh, you probably get a lot of that from, you know, just generally as, (laughs) as the teacher anyways, you're definitely like squirreling the whole time. Like, just like looking back and forth. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, look at that over there. Oh God, that'd be so crazy. I I've never been anything like that. I would absolutely love to check something like that out. But unfortunately I think YouTube videos are the closest I'll get for a while. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, everybody keep making those YouTube videos with, you know, it's, it's mind blowing. So, uh, you had, did you have physical copies of your last album? I want to say, I thought I saw CDs of it around. I, I did. Um, which I got rid of them all, thankfully. I I did not order that many. If um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if I'll do that with this album, just because it's kind of like, man, it's it like takes a while to get rid of CDs. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I just don't think I will. Um, the one thing I'd be open to is vinyl, but even vinyl, like around here, is like. I don't. Know, you have to like buy so many, and mm-hmm. then like, and then you got to sell them for like. You know they're expensive to make, so you got to sell them like to recoup. And mm-hmm. um, you know I could probably list like a handful, ten, fifteen people that I know would buy them, buy one. But then it's like, okay, we get... what do I do with <laughs> like the eighty-five others? <laughs> yeah, eighty-five. <laughs> oh, uh, you man. might have to get like a hundred made or yeah. like fifty made or something. Yeah, it's true. I was thinking like I can't remember how many we got with Three Finger Betty. I think we got like the smallest amount we could make at like the the lowest price point was two hundred for what we wanted, and oh, we're really? like we're like close. To finally selling them all, but it's been, uh, what, two years almost sure. now? So it's, yeah. you know, it's, I mean, that, and the same thing with CDs. We bought 200 CDs and it's, we're finally yeah. down to like the last little wedge of them. And it's like, okay, yep. do we order more or should we just call it good? Because <laughs> is anybody going to remember this two, and two years is it slowing? I don't know. It's just physical media is such a weird thing. Yep. And I still like holding it, but I also like. Oh, dude, I love albums. I mean. Vinyl, Yes. Uh, CDs though it's like my computer doesn't even have a CD player like my uh, my other computer doesn't have a CD yeah. player you know so about like older cars is the best bet you have now you know yeah, yeah exactly if, you, if you're gonna put it out on tape forget it you know there are people actually doing that though that's like starting to weirdly come back so I don't know dude the vintage stuff is you know yeah I'll be. I'll, it's like taking a hold again a little bit, you know. I'll be happy when somebody puts something out on eight track. So if this new <laughs> album comes out on eight track, I'll buy a copy. But I'll probably stick to streaming it. But otherwise, <laughs> I uh, didn't make many notes for this episode, and we've got oh hey, we got almost exactly an hour in, hey, which is kind of weird how it all works out like that. But uh, is there anything I didn't mention about uh, you, your upbringing, the the 2018 album or the upcoming album that you have uh you know i don't i don't think so i'm you know i'm excited to get this album out people can go to neil anders music facebook and and look me up they can get updates on like when the album uh release date and stuff like that and uh yeah i don't know that you know i wrote the album during um you know, like the riots and the pandemic. And I was like going to be a soon to be father. So like, there's like a lot of material, you know, so like some of it's a reflection of that. Um, but then, you know, like I said, I'll, the kind of opens up with the kind of like a, a silly song again, something like just a fun song with horns and, but, uh, there'll be some acoustic tracks and things like that. So yeah, I don't know, just excited about the album and hope, hope people can check it out and, yeah, well, I'll be that's look- about all I got. I'll be looking forward to it. I'll put links to your social media down below in the description. Awesome. So anybody that's listening, just scroll down, go ahead and click on it. Uh, you know, the the first album, I, it's probably not the nicest way to say it. I don't know if the, what the it, I don't want to say it took me by surprise, but I was just like, holy cow, this is good. So I'm really looking forward to the upcoming album. <laughs> Thanks, dude. And uh, man, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no, I, I'm sorry it took so long, hey. but uh, <laughs> it's always a it's a extreme pleasure to talk with you it was fun it was worth the wait all that hype (laughs) (laughs) good to see you man awesome holy moly everything i heard was rumored was true uh neil's an amazing person that's pretty much like what got repetitively rumored to me 
Uh, the guy's the guy's insane. He's writing all this stuff. He's recording all this stuff. He's playing all the instruments. He's doing all the singing. He's playing the drums. And like I said in in the episode, if if he thinks that he is gonna do better on the next album, I can't wait to hear it because he did an amazing job doing it all by himself on the first one. But the next album is upcoming. Uh, make sure you check out the social media down below for Neil Anders so you can stay updated and you do not miss the release date of his new album coming out. Uh, it will be coming out soon. I do think prior to the release of this episode, he may or may not have uh, popped a couple singles out there. I don't know. Check it out. It It's there on his social media. I saw him post something about it. So all I got to say is this episode was amazing. You know, like Neil being a, a, a musician from the pretty much infancy up until now. He's a music teacher. He can play all the instruments wild wild stuff and then on top of that he's recording everything i didn't know he double majored and has all the, the recording background that he does just can't believe it i can't believe it the guy's crazy he's making amazing music uh like i said in the episode if you're a fan of anything from like beatles through tom petty uh he mentioned uh neil young anything in those genres you're gonna love this so check out his album from 2018 check out the new album it is going to be amazing i cannot wait so uh yeah check out the social medias down below give them a follow give them a like uh let them know you heard them here and uh check out that new album yeah it's gonna be great if you guys are looking for anything audible farm you can go to the audible farm website audiblefarm.com find links to everything there such as all the social medias where you can give us a follow give us a like give us a subscribe you can also find us on youtube if you're listening to this on youtube go ahead and give us a subscribe on youtube slowly growing those subscribers i love it thank you guys very very much otherwise video versions are available on the patreon channel patreon videos are one dollar a month you can watch all of the patreon videos there's almost a hundred episodes on the patreon right now uh so theoretically you could technically sign up for one month for a dollar watch the 94 episodes or whatever that are on there and then if you can get it done by the end of the month, boom, you're done. You only paid me a dollar and you got to intake all that amazing Patreon content. So check it out. It's over there on the Patreon, $1 a month. Otherwise, yeah, there's the Audible Farm shop, shop.audiblefarm.com. Find all your Audible Farm merch. If you guys are looking for anything like that, we got stickers and t-shirts and all sorts of goodies over there. Otherwise, that's it. That's it. I'm out of here for this week. Thank you guys very much for joining me. Thank you once again to my amazing guest this week, Neil Anders. Check out his album. Uh, new album coming out. It's going to be great. All right. See you guys. Peace.